in among all the pious policing of people's language and whether it's a deep cultural insult to wear a pair of lederhosen if you're not a Bavarian, there is a reasonable point about the words we choose. The murder of Reese Jones, police tapes, ITV, reminded us of that early on as the voiceover and news footage from the time talked about the people behind the 10-year-old's killing. Words such as gang warfare, feud, rivalry, and gunmen were sprayed about like bullets. And like bullets, they were dangerous. As the program delved into the investigation, talking to detectives who'd worked on the case a decade ago, as well as Reese still shattered mum and dad, one thing became very clear. Not one of these gangsters was John Gotti. Not one of these tracksuit-wearing deadbeat street corner bullies would have got a job ironing the Cray Twins' gym jams. I'm not suggesting that mafiosi and East End vice lords are anything other than thugs, and I'm not suggesting they deserve any more respect. It's the respect that no marks to borrow an old scouse. Praise, like Reese murderers have for them that's the issue. An idiot child peddling around the corner on his bike to settle a score, without the imagination to consider that his ancient gun might kill someone and ruin dozens of lives, is not a gunman. He wants to be a gunman, and calling him that gives him exactly what he wants. The covert police recordings revealed the truth, little boys who needed their mums and dads to help them cover up the crime, grinning on the streets as if they'd just let the teachers' tires down. The only gang warfare they were involved in was on the Xbox. As you'd expect from the title, The Double Life of George Michael. Channel 5 was full of paradoxes. Some were obvious. A man loved by millions, who never found lasting love of his own. A face recognized everywhere, belonging to someone who felt deeply alone. A massive talent, sabotaged by stupid actions. Songs that spoke truth from a man who kept things hidden. Perhaps the saddest thing revealed by this documentary, biopic, though, was how much insight George seemed to have. In interviews stretching back to the early days of Wham!, he came across as one who knew exactly what his faults and foibles were. He spoke often about craving approval. He noticed that however hard he tried to ruin things, his career seemed to bounce back. He saw an obvious link between the addiction to praise and stardom, and his fondness for drugs and booze. You could see how wound up, serious and introverted he was, even sitting on the breakfast telly sofas next to Andrew Ridgely. George's school chum was beaming away, relaxed, talking about all the fun he was having. George's brow was furrowed, back hunched, as he wondered out loud how many more countries they needed to conquer. It was the classic nerd, Romeo combination of the soaps and kids shows and George, incredibly to people who only saw the later megastardom, was the nerd. But intelligence only gets you so far. This sad but sympathetic film revealed to us a man with brains to see exactly what was wrong but lacking what it took to change it.